Gentlemen, the time has come once again to discuss things. Longest yeah boy ever. Yeah boy! <laughs> going. Oh, Hello <God>. everyone. <laughs> I am a geek for fun. Hey, what's up? I'm that Matt Kid, your boy. And we are your geeky gentlemen. And today we are going to be doing a review. Woo! Inspired by the wonderful, lovely, amazingly handsome, cursed, horrible person who I despise. Smugstick. Uh, Luis wanted to be on for this episode, but he couldn't, so he decided to pick mm. the topic. And he was a big Spider Man fan. I'm a big Spider Man fan. Not as. Matt's a big Spider Man fan, right? But you're not. It, it Not as well read. Yeah, I mean, I, that gets into that. Yeah, I, like, I like Spider Man a lot. Obviously, big fan of, like, the films and, and the spectacular Spider Man cartoon show and things like that. But my, my comic history of uh the spider guy is is actually kind of limited um i've really only read bendis's ultimate run um and that's really about it i i've read la- i've read craven's last hunt i've read bendis's ultimate run and i've seen you know all of the the 90s show and spectacular spider-man so like i've, I've seen enough that i i don't like i feel like i i definitely am a fan but i, I haven't read a lot of proper mainstream marvel universe spider-man really Mm-hmm. And that's why I kind of I'm glad we ended up with this because I feel like this is a good test um, to see if this book actually lives up to this premise. If you have been listening to this podcast for a while now, um, when Ian was running the show, Ian would often say that one of the biggest issues Marvel has, and I, I think he's dead on the money with this, is that they don't have a lot of books which can stand alone. They don't have a lot of books which you can just give to someone. Like, DC is full of it. Mm All-Star Superman, Superman Birthright, Wonder Woman Earth 1, anything Batman, really, (laughs) you could give to people, and they'll be able to get into it and then go from there. It's very standalone, very Elseworld-centric. Marvel does the what-ifs, but they're not... they, They are almost continuity even more so because they're, spe- they're talking about specific events and specific issues marvel doesn't really like to do the one-off out of continuity stories um which kind of tell a whole character's life or something like a superman mm-hmm. red sun so when chip zadarsky pitched this and said he was going to do that for spider-man the closest thing we got to that before was called um, Spider-Man Blue. And even then, that's a retelling of 60 Spider-Man stories that's meant to be like the new continuity version. So it's still not actually new read. It, most people can pick that and read it up, but it's still seeped in continuity. This is meant to reference that and kind of Spider-Man's greatest hits, but restructure mm-hmm. it in a way where... It's one story. It's all of Spider-Man's continuity and kind of like an injection. Um, So giving that to Matt, I thought would be really interesting being able to see, okay, what's what's the opinion? Did this work? Is this followable? Or is this something that Marvel's attempt to get into DC's kind of like Elseworlds, you can pick up and read it story, or did it just become incomprehensible? Um, I'm, I'm curious to see where we land on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it was funny because reading this, it was because, you know, I know what the clone saga is mm-hmm. and I know what Civil War was. I haven't like, again, my my Marvel comic book history is is not there. It's it's really not. So, like, I, I vaguely know what these things are. Like, I know what was it? Secret Wars. I don't even fucking know. Secret Wars where he gets the black suit. Like, I mm-hmm. know that these are things that happen. But I don't – and I know that, like, you know, Iron Man fights Cap. I know that that's when he gets the black suit. But I don't really – I've not read them, so I don't really know the the full story. And so this was kind of interesting because I'm, I'm going through this, and I don't know how much of it is accurate to what actually happened in the stories and what of it is not. But at the same time, I never found myself, like – bouncing off this or anything i i thoroughly enjoyed my time with it 
Um, it moves like it moves real fast because of how much they they go through in each. I mean, every every book is essentially a snapshot of a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this book moves like crazy. Like you, you, you've got like that first issue, um, that opens really strongly with, with Peter debating about whether or not he wants to go, uh, help the war in Vietnam. And then, and then suddenly now green goblin knows he's Peter Parker all of a sudden. And now we're dealing with this green goblin plot and like the whole, like it, it, it just, it moves like crazy. So like, it's definitely, as soon as you feel like you get your bearings in, in one decade, it moves to the next and it moves to the next and you just kind of have to be able to roll with the punches. I think it helps to vaguely know what these things are. Like, like when they start getting into the clone stuff um, with, with Ben Riley and things like that, I'm just like, okay, I know that this is a thing. I know Scarlet spider is a clone of Peter and I know that that, and I know that there's a whole, like, who's the real clone. Like, I know that that is a thing. And I feel like having I feel like just having the basic knowledge of what they're talking about helps. Um, but not having read any of those things, I don't think it's I don't think it made me bounce off or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that because it's also it, it's something that I think really shows the the craft on display, um, because I think Zadarsky just gets Spider-Man. And that's such a relief to yeah. say, um, because really for 10 years now we've had Dan Slott on the book and he's moved off and got Nick Spencer on and sadly I know a lot of people do enjoy those runs but for me it's always kind of that I've missed Spider-Man I haven't got to see Spider-Man in a long time since Ben just left the woman really um, and like his Peter died like I I feel like Spider-Man's kind of just been gone I haven't had my Peter the one who like did all the things like as in this story so getting this where it's basically alright here's that guy who you miss He's an old man now. He's done... This is all of his life. I think has been... It, it was really exciting for me as a reader because it felt like, wow, can we get an old friend back? This specific characterization from Beta who's been through all these events and is kind of just breaking <laughs> under mm -hmm. all these things as um, a, conspar uh, a comparison I like to do is like Daredevil is like a character who always gets his life ruined. Batman's kind of the same. But the reason they take it is because they've just grit their teeth and they'll push through and they'll come out. Spider-Man getting his life ruined is equivalent to kicking a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man will not grit his teeth and grind through. Spider-Man will just cry. <laughs> and yep. I think that's really interesting to have for a protagonist where because this is so decade to decade to decade to decade, it kind of really shows you just how bad Marvel has shit on this dude. Rightly oh, yeah. so, because it's led to good stories. But it's when it's in this decompressed format where we're not, it doesn't feel like it's been that long since the last tragedy, it really feel, gives you like a perspective like, oh my god, <laughs> this guy could not catch a goddamn break. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, um, because I mean, it, it seems like that's kind of the thing. Like every decade is defined by some new horrible thing that happens to the guy be it in spider in his life as spider-man or in his personal life with the breakdown of his relationships with his friends which is a side of spider-man storytelling that i love i love that's one of the things that always drew me to spider-man i like the there's so much interplay between his personal life and his superhero life and just really leans into the idea that one of these is always going to affect the other and a lot of times in a bad way um, and so I've always loved that, that Peter's sense of responsibility uh, is ruining his life and ruining the friendships and the important relationships to him and things like that. Um, and that's an aspect of the character that I always really liked. But I mean, you go from fucking, you know, Norman trying to kill him and all of his friends and, you know, seemingly losing his memory to then, you know, everything with the clones and then you've got getting buried alive by fucking, you know, the uh, uh, Craven. It's just like just decade after decade. This dude, it's like every decade is defined by some new horrible thing that happens to him, um, which I think is you're I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that's part of what makes the character stick, because um, we get to see Peter deal with all these horrible things. I mean, it, it's, it's, it makes for incredible storytelling. It makes for incredible drama. Um, and it makes it very, very easy to sort of define these, these keystone moments. Um, because I mean, this is basically going through a rundown of greatest 
you know, kind of Spider-Man stories, right? I mean, you've got uh, everything with Norman and the Green Goblin, the Clone Saga, Craven's Last Hunt, the the Black Suit. I mean, this is kind of running the gambit of, okay, let's find a list of all the most popular, well-known Spider-Man stories, and let's tie these com- together in kind of a compelling way that actually shows these as as each horrible and and sort of defining moments in this person's life where at multiple times in the book it almost feels like he's lost everything Mm -hmm. it's um it's one of those things where i guess well this is a long thought so actually i'll save that and what we'll do is because it's about the 10 minute mark i don't mind we've already kind of gone into spoilers a little bit but now we'll go deeper because this lends itself so well to this i kind of want to go decade by decade sure (laughs) um so we start off uh 60 1962 uh spider-man uh it kind of at is like zenith and probably the one that feels like the most if you were going to make like a period piece spider-man movie this would mm-hmm. be the whole thing, right? And I kind of want that. Yeah. <laughs> like, Spider-Man dealing with not only being a, a a teen superhero, but a teen superhero in 1960 is something that at the time they couldn't really deal with. But in retrospect, if you look back at the character, you're like, well, okay, then Peter would... This is... Vietnam is something he would have to deal with. What would that look like? Flash Thompson yeah. goes because he's inspired by Spider-Man. It's one of the most heartbreaking things oh I've ever read. Oh my god, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I... Th- like, that... You know, it's funny, because I've, I've, I've talked with you before. Like, the thing that's kind of prevented me um, from going back and, and, like, really properly reading the full run of Spider-Man... Um, and this is probably going to like, you know, look, call me a casual comic <laughs> fan if you want. But I, I have I just am not filled with a desire to go back and read a bunch of stuff from the 60s. They can never personally. call you a casual again. You just read the entire history of Spider-Man. <laughs> That's true. Um, but shit, man, like I read this and I was just like, man, I would love this. And obviously this is probably not what the actual 60s Spider-Man comics are like. But reading this, I was just like, man, I, I love this. Like to open it up with Spider-Man, with Peter not knowing how he feels about the draft. Cause on the one hand, obviously there are people dying. It's a war. He feels that he has the power to shift things, but should he, is this a war that is it? And that that's so fucking good. Like it, it drew me in immediately. Um, and to even see the way that, um, Iron Man and cap play into that. Oh, um, I love I, the captain yeah. America. stuff. Yeah. Captain this. America going fucking rogue and just being a fucking like, ah, oh, shit. It's so good. That's so um, good. Like that, <laughs> like that you don't understand how happy that was when I was no, reading this. Was, I was thinking it was just going to be Spider-Man, but they also like, no, no, no. Right. It's not just Spider-Man's our protagonist, but we're right. also taking the entire Marvel universe and seeing mm-hmm. what that would look like if it actually aged in real time. And seeing Captain America being like, yeah, I have to go and see for myself what's happening. And then, and then he getting there and just and he's like, just nah, like, fuck this shit. Fuck America. This yeah, I love it. It's so good. <laughs> no, it's really good. Um, and of course, everyone thinking that he's turn traitor or at least the other might be he's just like no i'm i'm seeing this the way it is and you know i'm not going to allow innocent people to be hurt and things like that like it's oh it's so good i lost my shit when that happened it was great um and it was funny because like at at first i when i didn't fully know exactly what they were doing with the book i was like okay well if captain america has decided he's going to uh, not side with the U.S. in this conflict, and he's going to try to really just kind of stop the fighting whenever he can and, and save innocent people. Um, but Tony Stark, which I have questions about that, but if Iron Man is going to kind of be on the side of the American government, maybe this is going to be like them doing civil war, but they're using the, the the Vietnam War as a way to do that. And that's kind of what they do, but obviously the actual superhero civil war happens later. Um, but as someone who really didn't totally know exactly how much this was going to diverge from, from typical Marvel history, uh, really compelled by all of that. Um, I thought that was all absolutely, uh, just genius. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And it's something where being able to, again, retroactively, because this is, this is becomes a trend 
not only do we deal with all the main continuity things that happen every decade, every single decade, if there has a historical event that's big, gets mentioned. And this even makes up a few, yep. but we'll, we'll get to them. But it's like, it's, it, it doesn't pull any punches with stuff like that. Um, cool. Which I think is really interesting because the Marvel characters have always kind of had that look outside your window feel, but because of their nature as comic book characters and they have to continue to be updated, you kind of lose some of that where they have to always be... Like Peter Parker in the 60s to Peter Parker now is meant to be the same dude, yet now he's got a smartphone. So it's like, is it really the same guy? Like, But with this, you really get to say, though, this is the most real... It's not realistic. We're not taking away his powers, but we're looking at as if superheroes were just a thing that existed yeah. in the real world. All their caveats, all their costumes, everything, but it's still the real world, and these are the consequences. Kind of like an X Men first class kind of thing, but pushed even further, yep. because we're not saying mutants were behind Vietnam. We're just saying no, no. But if Vietnam was a thing, Iron Man would would be sent in, because specifically, um, something that's been the problem with Iron Man is kind of the same deal as the Punisher, is because his whole deal is he has to be. He has his origin is tied to a war, to a conflict. Mm -hmm. It always has to get updated. Um, originally, it was Vietnam, so it makes total sense that Iron Man would fucking the moment he gets on his suit, he'd go back and kind of like Iron Man one wage war style because Tony's yeah. kind of got that vendetta. Just he's a he's an angry dude sometimes if you wrong him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there was in the in the first issue one of my favorite moments is um, the conversation that Pete and Flash have in the bar. Mm. Um, and it's it's beyond just the, the Flash saying, I'm going because of Spider-Man. It's that Pete's still kind of being a petty little bitch, which I love. Like, Pete's kind of... Whenever we do that story of, like, Peter's the nerd outcast, he gets the superpowers, and now he's kind of on this power trip, and he's, he's a little cocky, he's... He's getting in people's faces because he's got the the muscle to back it up now. And he kind of gets in Flash's face, even though Flash is kind of over this conflict. And he's got that moment where he's just like, I'm sorry, I know you're different now, but I'm like, sometimes I still kind of get back in that that mind space from when we were in high school. Um, and like, I just, I fucking loved that. And then Flash kind of levels with him. Like that whole scene uh, is is phenomenal. It's probably my favorite scene in the in the first issue, um, and so I love that. I love that we're tackling Pete kind of being a bit of an ass head on, um, and we're giving him these these genuine moments. Like he just feels like such a, a like um, Zadarsky, whose whose work I'm I'm vaguely familiar with. I know he's done some work. Uh, I know like Sex Criminals is is him and someone else, and I know he did some work on like Jughead with Archie, and he's done some other Spider Man stuff. But man, um, I found, uh, you know, something to grab onto in every issue, something really compelling in every issue. Um, and that, that scene in the bar where they have that little conversation is what really kind of hooked me into this. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And it's, um, something else, which I like once, once we get out the bar and we kind of do our first retelling and this is where I get to put my Spider-Man continuity hat, is we do a retelling of the, the first time the Green Goblin found out Spider-Man's identity. We even have the iconic panel, which is, is referenced in nearly every Green Goblin Spider-Man fight. It's in Spectacular, it's in 90s, where Peter Parker's like tied up and got Green Goblin's on his glider, and he's, hang, he's holding uh, Spider-Man while he's flying away with his glider, and he's like, his shirt's kind of ripped, and he's like, if only I could get free! He's like, every... Every Green Goblin Spider-Man adaption does that shot for some reason. It's just become iconic. Mm. They have that fight. And like in the issue, uh, Norman gets hit in the way where he gets amnesia. Uh, and you're not, you're not sure if he's faking it or not. But Spider-Man believes that he's, he's not. In continuity, Peter's like, well... I, I'll just leave him. I guess he's fine. <laughs> so he doesn't. <laughs> he just leaves him. And then when Norman gets his his memory back, is like a hundred issues later. He he guns Green Goblin and he kills Gwen. Be and and it's like because Peter just let it let it slide. This feels like the first time that Zadarsky's kind of like putting into check <laughs> like <laughs> Peter a little bit. He's like, no, maybe 
great power, great responsibility. You probably should still get him in jail if you know he's yeah. the Green Goblin, even if he's got amnesia. <laughs> so that's something that it still comes back to bite him. But I, I really like that scene where, because I was expecting that was the first sign to me that even though I know supposedly the order of these things and what's going to happen, it's still throwing curveballs because I I was like, well, okay, he didn't do that before. <laughs> he didn't he didn't actually risk his identity. That's actually a, a, a brave choice, um, which I think also makes sense given this Peter is a little older than Peter would be at that time in publication history because again he was he wasn't aging. But in this, he actually has been aging since 15. Um, all of that, I thought, was fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. We'll get more into some of the Norma moments later on. But all three of, like, Spider-Man's biggest villains, Dark Ark, Norman, and Venom, will get, like, shine here. Which I think, is again, yeah. is intentional. There's um, Obviously, some get more focus than others. Venom's kind of the one who's, the, who's kind of the, the weak link in that he's mostly just a brute, but he, he serves that purpose well. But all of them... All of them get a little bit of shine, um, which again, six issues. This packs in so much. Oh yeah, no, it does. Um, and yeah, I mean, I agree. I think you can obviously. Again, I, I'm not familiar with the original story, but I think yeah, that's a that's a very easy way to say like, look, maybe 15 year old Peter would have made that decision, but this is Peter. Um, he's like 19 or 20 yeah. in the first issue. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, a 19 year old or 20 year old Peter. Um, maybe he's thinking a, a few more steps ahead than 15 year old Peter would be. Um, and so, yeah. And I mean, it, and it's not like it doesn't come back. Like, I mean, you know, Norman does still end up coming back decades from now to try and ruin Peter's life again. Um, so, I mean, it's, um, but I mean, again, I, I didn't really have that subversive moment, obviously, cause I'm not familiar with that. Speaking on to something else then, uh, yeah. we now move on to the seventies. And this is the first time that I was really surprised um, is that we've already we already married off Peter and Gwen. Um, Yeah, I was surprised by that, too. I was like, whoa, okay." And and then we open with something which, again, great subversive. But this time it's just heart strings (laughs) is you think he's talking to Uncle Ben's grave and then we pan out Mm -hmm. and he's talking to Flash's grave. And I'm like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Yep. Good stuff. Um. And it, it, it's it's one of those, like, it's one of those smaller moments. Because, I mean, Peter's life is always going to shit. But it's one of those great moments where, you know, he was the one who inspired Flash to go do this. And if it wasn't for him, Flash maybe wouldn't have been inspired and wouldn't have. I mean, he still could have gotten drafted, I guess. But, you know, he was the reason why he went off to war. So that's another, that's just another thing that he feels responsible for. That's just another uh, another piece of weight on, on his back. Um and I know I loved it. Uh, that was a really great opener to the second issue for sure. Mm-hmm. And it's um, in terms of the real life stakes, we also kind of have the fact that the Vietnam War is still going on, mm-hmm. which is kind of this is where you kind of I, I like as well that although it's a badass moment where Cap comes in like he's defending it, it also shows you well Cap's making it last longer. Yeah, because he's too good at defending it, and it's just kind of like, ooh. Then it's, it feels a lot like Watchmen, where exactly. they deal with what the superheroes would be like in this. Uh, whereas Watchmen, it's like, oh no, the Vietnam ended, war ended like a week because Doctor Manhattan just fucking stomped everyone. In Marvel, there's not that big of a power difference, so Iron Man versus Captain America in the Vietnam in like Vietnam feels like, oh yeah, that could last forever. <laughs> they just mm-hmm. keep going at it. So like that is that is another thing where I'm like. It's interesting that we're we're having these moral judgments where Cap won't ever quit, but that might be doing more harm than good. And Peter's still kind of, even at this point, like he's working with Reed Richards now, which I, I I really like that. I like that we get a nod to Spider-Man having a big connection with the Fantastic Four, where he works at the Bas- Baxter Building. Um, he's not just a photographer his whole life. Um, I really really like that. Uh, but we still get to see he's kind of struggling. Um, with the desire to want to help, like he, all these big devices, all these world-changing things, he wants to go and use them because he feels like it's their responsibility. But Reed's kind of the one who, because at this point, Peter's before he's got Gwen, he he hasn't gone through the draft. Flash dying has been a bad thing, but this is probably the most, ha- at least for a little bit, 
This is the yeah. happiest we see Peter at the moment. Is when he feels he feels like his life is completely sorted out at this point. At the halfway point of this issue, because then it all goes to shit. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's interesting because like this issue threw two curveballs at me. I was like, well, first of all, there's there's him being married, and then there's um, there's you know Flash. But then as soon as we're just like, oh, no, Octavius is good now. And he married Aunt May. And I'm just like, wait, what? OK, sure. all right, let's just, let's, just, let's just go. Let's just OK, we'll just move forward. Let's just move, let's just keep going. Um, those are those are the types of things where I'm just like, this is weird. I don't I don't like I don't know if that was ever a thing that yeah, happened in the was. comics. So if it was or if it wasn't, I'm just going to take it on the chin and keep going. Um, so th- there were moments like that where I was just like, OK, sure. And then, like, I actually got to be really surprised by the clone thing. I had no idea that's where they were going. because I don't fucking know who Dr. Warren is. I don't know. So then they get to, like, revealing that the clones are a thing. Um, and I was legitimately surprised by it. I was just like, oh, shit, the clones. And there's three of them. What? Like, I... Because again, all I know is that Ben Riley is a thing that exists. So this was a, this issue was one where my lack of of knowledge. Again, I knew the basics that there was a clone arc that Ben Riley was a clone and all that stuff, but I didn't really know any of the details. So I got to be a, like really pleasantly surprised and kind of kind of go for the ride that the book was taking me on in this issue. Um, and so this issue was when I started having a lot of fun with it. I mean, you had uh, first of all Spidey's cool suit design and then the black goblin whose suit is just fucking baller as yeah. shit yeah uh, I, I really like, hope oh that I, I, I hope that's something that because everyone harry's been the goblin for a while and the, everyone kind of always struggles to find a name for him the black goblins are really cool let's just keep that all right we found it we <laughs> found out what his name is now when he becomes the goblin let's th- let's just move this on from now because that's it that's you figured it out <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and this is um this is Mark Bagley. Yes, on the art, which is right. Yeah, this is perfect. Yeah, which is a cool. Given you got off because I mean, at this point, a lot of people were kind of like, "Oh, maybe they should do like a different artist for every issue," and that could have been cool as well. But you want to yeah. make this feel like one life, and exactly. you got to get the most definitive Spider-Man artist on this. And like John Romita, Ju- uh, John Romita Senior is still around, but uh, I doubt he could do a whole six-issue book right now. Steve Ditko's obviously passed away. Uh, Tom McFarlane, I don't, I don't think he'd be up for it. <laughs> so <laughs> Mark Bagley, yeah, he's the he he's the guy who defines Spider Man for a lot of people. He defines Spider Man for me. To me, he is probably the definitive modern Spider Man artist. I I don't see anyone yeah. else who could top Bagley in that department. Um, so yeah, him doing all these issues, I think is fantastic. And I also think it's really cool for you because <laughs> it feels like, okay, I don't have to change <laughs> my Spider-Man comic art tastes. <laughs> no, it, it, it was, it was interesting though. Cause it, it's, it's seeing, you know, um, Mark Bagley's he's like, obviously he's, it's been years since ultimate Spider-Man. He's, he's not really doing that exact same style necessarily. And he's obviously drawing a very different Peter Parker. Um, Cause he's drawing Peter obviously based off the original books. He's got kind of the, the, the combed back hair with a little he's like spit older. curl. Yeah. He's much older. So he's, it's, it's really cool to see that. Like it's really cool to see um, uh, Bagley's art, but kind of, um, it's it's like what if he was drawing the main you know the main uh, Spider Man books and stuff like that, but this issue just took me on a lot of surprises. I loved the whole um, Mary Jane uh, being with uh, Harry and her her snapping at Peter's kind of perceived holier than thou attitude of acting like he cares when he's never around and he's never you know all the all these kinds of things. And it's just another example of that that type of uh, the the balance of relationship between Peter and Spider-Man that I always love to see. Um, so if the first issue kind of started to get me hooked to this issue, I was just, I was having just a fucking ball. I, I, I adored everything about this. Um, and then even the like, Oh no, but like Gwen is the clone and the, the real one is the one that just, died. I'm just like, Oh fuck. That's yeah. Not, that's not how Gwen died in the comics. I know that, but that was a surprise. I don't know if that's a thing in the, like, like that was me, the, the entire what time I was reading this. I was just like, well, I don't know if that actually happened, but that was cool. That was like, <laughs> that was me the entire book. Um, so yeah. 
That one actually, that one actually got me. That one, yeah? actually, that one actually teared me off a bit. That that the oh, end yeah. of this issue as well, where Peter just breaks down with MJ. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. because that was like, I was like, okay, okay, okay. So yes. I was, yeah, trying, his, I was trying to, yeah. I was trying to count like how many things we were doing because I was trying to figure out. Well, the 70s kind of. The seventies when Spider Man kind of fucking like all the most famous stories for Spider Man are from the seventies. That's Spectacular Spider Man, like those two seasons, that's all seventies Spider Man stories. Like at bit beat for beat for beat for beat. Like but this is one issue and I'm like, how are they gonna do it? What what are we doing here? So we, we get Harry's uh, a drug use. We deal with that. Yeah. We, we are Harry's Harry's uh, taking too much, and he's not as good with it. He's kind of got depression because of his dad and everything. And he's with MJ, which was a thing. But they're married in this, and like it's MJ is kind of just going through the motions because she hasn't had that development from the party girl persona that she will. Like in in, in our time, we know MJ as that's the facade and that she moved right. away. But in continuity, it did take like 10 years for that development to happen. <laughs> so if she actually aged 10 years plus, <laughs> she would be kind of fucked by the time that revelation came out. <laughs> like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. I actually have more than this. So that's already being dealt with. And then we get the Miles Warren stuff. And and the Miles Warren thing is so fucked because he's like, yeah, he's going to do Clone Saga, but are they going to do... Clone Saga now? Or are they going to do it in the 90s? Like, which one do we go? And I'm like, okay, we're doing it now, apparently. Um, they do the three clones, and then they do Harry Goblin. And I'm like, okay, we're doing Harry Goblin as well. <laughs> that happened in the 70s. What are we fucking doing? And then Harry Goblin takes out everything, and they have this big fight, and everything goes off. And you think they've saved Gwen, and that Gwen's going to keep going, because they've married him. And I was like, okay, maybe this is the change. Maybe we keep Gwen for a while, because Gwen's a big thing now. With Spider Gwen and everything, maybe maybe Gwen's the one who stays and MJ stays with Harry or something. Like, I don't know what was going on, and then you find out, oh no, Warren is just the creepiest Spider Man villain you'll ever meet. Like, yeah, he's even worse in the comics where he's got like a green body suit and he calls himself the Jackal, but his motivations are entirely the same. He just really wants to fuck Gwen Stacy. Like, <laughs> it's it's so weird to have that as a super villain motivation. <laughs> yeah, um, but like he just really wants to fuck Gwen. Uh, so he, he's like, no, I was keeping the real one for me. And Peter's like, no, he gets it, and he, he does the iconic holding holding Gwen's body pose. And then we 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 have Ben, Ben and Clone Gwen. Uh, they move off together, which I really like that as well, because Ben Riley mm-hmm. kind of gets a fucking a rough beat <laughs> in the comics. It's like Ben Riley's life is actually kind of pretty pretty better than Peter's in this, honestly. <laughs> uh, so Ben and Gwen go off. Because they've still got all their memories. I was like, oh, that, that's sweet, at least. At least that's... We're not completely fridging Gwen. We, we still have a version of her go off. And then we just have Peter just break down in anger and everything. His entire life's gone to ruin uh, in front of MJ. And which is, again, the very... F- the, the bit in the, in the issue where Gwen dies in main mm-hmm. continuity... Uh, Peter does the same thing. He's like, MJ, you're always a party girl. Why are you here? You can hear. You don't care. You never cared about Gwen. You don't care about us. You don't understand. I'm just a loser. So just leave. Have your fun. Bye. Like he just snaps at her. And this is kind of the definitive reason why Mary Jane and Peter will always be a, t- a thing. Is MJ turns to leave and then she stops and then she closes the door and she stays with him. And that's how that issue ends. And we never see. And that's where their relationship starts. Is from that moment of she's the only one in the whole world who was patient with Peter when he did do his snap, uh, and then they do this, they do it here, and I thought it was so beautiful, like, it actually choked me up. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> they just did everything. They did the seventies issue of Spider-Man comics <laughs> in one issue. So yeah, this this issue was phenomenal. This was the one where I was like, issue one, I was like, oh, this is this is a great comic. Issue two, where I was like, oh, this is this is this is seminal. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's that that ending. Um, with, uh, you know, Peter snapping at her. Um, that is all great stuff, especially as someone who grew up in it. I mean, that's one thing I liked about Spider-Man. He, he would let his problems get to the point where he had to just break down and, and lash out either in, in sadness or pain or hurt. Um, and it's one of those things like when he, when he yells, like, where's my new life to MJ? Um, it's just so good. I, I just love it. It's it's great. Um, cause I mean, I I don't have the history with it like you do, but I I could still feel kind of the 
emotional baggage of what was going on based on the history of the character. Um, and yeah, I mean, these first two issues could not have opened this up more strongly. Mm-hmm. Moving on then to the 80s. And I'm very... This one, like, um, the covers for these, I just want to take a moment to say they are absolutely beautiful. But mm-hmm. the cover for this one, where it's the black Spider-Man suit in the coffin with yeah. the, with nukes dropping down. Oh, <laughs> I had that as my <laughs> wallpaper for the longest time when these were coming out. Because that one, so, I, I love how the black, it's black Spider-Man suit is, like, one of the best costumes in comics. So whenever that yeah. gets some shine, I'm all for it. And this does the adaption of Secret Wars, Craven's Last Hunt, and the Venom stuff. Um, and this one I thought was really interesting because this is the first time where we're starting to see Peter off his game a little bit because he, he is getting older. He's like in his he's in his late thirties now, um, and I thought that was interesting that that we, that we were so issue free and we're already getting into. The reason I'm using the black suit is I know it's a parasite. I'm not stupid, uh, which I, I've also feels like another retroactive. <laughs> this thing's alive. What that we do every time with Spider-Man in the black suit is like yeah. you're a scientist, Peter. It moves <laughs> on its own. It's probably alive. <laughs> I like that we directly reference that Peter knows it's that what it is and he knows the risk, but he needs the power boost to stay competitive. I thought that was a really unique twist on he's not a, he is addicted to the power but it's almost he's addicted to the power because he he feels like he it it's for a good like he has to be this strong he has to do all of this I thought that was really cool Yeah I mean it's just another example of um Zdarsky taking advantage of the premise of his own story uh to just make very natural and understandable changes to the source material this was the first, like, and it's such a minor thing, because, again, I don't care, but I was really confused as to where exactly the black suit came from. Like, he just walks into this room, and there's a machine, yeah, and then there's a ball there. And I'm just like, the fuck? Like, and I was just like, I assume this has more context than the original. It Maybe, doesn't. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's literally the exact same scene. Like, beat for beat, Thor and Hulk walk up, and they're like, ah, oh, Spider-Man, your costume's ripped. Go out, go into that machine, we've got, like, a... We've got like a thing where it heals your costume, and Spider Man's like, bat. So he walks in, <laughs> and <laughs> dumbass Peter Parker picks the wrong machine, which is like a prison for an alien beast. But we don't even find that out until decades later. In the original comic, he just goes oh. in, he's like, wow, this thing is fixing my costume. Wow. And he does the iconic pose where he's like, his hand, jazz hands out, and he's got like the thing on. Yeah, you don't, don't worry. That was the only bit that was adapted verbatim, and it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> See, would you have so okay, so let me ask you this. As like is that something you think that maybe Zadarsky should have changed? Like should he have said, look, if we're going to make this some seminal work on Spider-Man's life that's presumably able to be enjoyed by both people who are appreciating a look back at material they already know and potentially people who haven't read this material, should we have made it more clear what was happening or was it, I mean, again, I ultimately fall in. It's probably not that important because what's important is what they're doing thematically and what they're showing with the character. But are those small little changes, things they should have made to maybe improve on things that were not very well uh, established in the first place? I'm of two minds because my favorite origin for the black suit is the ultimate version where it's like a cure for cancer that Richard Parker mm-hmm. makes. I yeah. really love that idea for the for the symbiote. I think it fits Spider-Man's world a little more. Uh, Alien feels just too disconnected. It's fine. It's a comic book. He's a Steve Ditko character. He should have weird shit happen to him. So I'm fine with it. Um, but it's not it's not something I would do personally. So I would have I would, if it was me I would have gone with the Ulmer version. But what I like about this is it kind of. Mm-hmm. This version of the black suit happening feels like we're almost doing the spider bite again, where it is just a total coincidence that changes his life. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it on that level, because he's even in the same pose. It gets on his hand first. It's very much meant to be mm-hmm. this is his second spider bite. Um, and it's got, like he said, it's an even darker upgraded version, etc. So I'm, I'm fine with it in peace, and this is already packed as possible. 
So it really probably does serve have the quick and easy Black Suit Origin than it does For to sure. do the big uh, expansive Mifu one. But yeah, you're right. That probably that's probably something where um, out of all the revamps and retcons of this, um, someone who is completely blind to Spider-Man, like even then, you've watched all the movies, you've watched the shows, you've read the Ultimate Spider-Man. Someone who's completely blind to Spider-Man and read this probably be like, "What the fuck is this thing?" <laughs> well, yeah, I was because all I know is that Spider-Man gets the black suit during an event called Secret Wars. What is Secret Wars? How does he get the suit during Secret Wars? No fucking clue. I don't even know what it is. I just know that it happens. Um, I grew up with the my first exposure to the black suit story is the cartoon from the 90s mm-hmm. where um, it's something that gets brought back from space and that it gets on him when he's trying to save the astronauts. And I was I always thought that was fine. I, I still think that's a fine way to do it. Um, but I, I legitimately sat there at that page and I was just like, did I did I like miss a line or something? <laughs> like I kept rereading this page and I was just like, no, there's Hulk and Thor. Is, uh, did, did Reed say something? No. All right. Well, fucking, all right, let's go. Um, and again, ultimately, at the end of the day, it, it's not like it was some huge thing. I mean, obviously, this issue and the story on the whole are still um, incredibly impactful um, and, and incredibly well done regardless. But I was still just kind of like, OK, then <laughs> uh, I was thrown off by that a little bit. But then they do Craven's Last Hunt, which I actually have read. So fucking yes. Um, I really liked that they kind of lean into the cold war going yes, on with this it's so crazy got, how well that adds that, up right yeah we've got that amazing you've got that that really kind of beautiful i guess not beautiful but that, that kind of haunting moment with uh with the with vision um and then you've got the actual sort of craven's last hunt story where he's they're actually playing up that this is happening during a conflict between their two countries um and i love that that is so awesome. And I also love that like part of the reason Craven's going after him is because he kind of realizes that Spider-Man's getting older and he's not in his prime anymore. And he's kind of just like you were something more at one time and now you're just you're weaker and this is so I mean it's oh it's all good. Like I love it. Like it like Craven's Last Hunt obviously I think is pretty good, but this was I loved how they worked it in. Um, I love that it happens right after MJ and Peter have that like really intense fight where she's um, talking about feeling like she's never going to be as good as Gwen Stacy to him. Um, it's great. I, I loved all of that. Um, I think it was, and I love, I also like that he takes the suit off and what helps him get out of that burial is that the suit literally comes to find him. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, that shit's all so good. So you can still do the iconic cover of Spider-Man coming out of the grave in the black suit. It's too good. It's so good. That's such a smart Um, way of working that in. But he he does it and he's like venomized now. I mean, it's it's so cool. It's like, man, like obviously, you know, obviously it's one issue. It's not like it's like better than Craven's Last Hunt or whatever. But I really liked this a lot. Like I was just like, oh shit. Um, And because of how fast paced this is, because um Zdarsky only gets a book per decade he's just got to move and he's he's got like no filler no no like every panel every page has to be important um and you really feel it in this um it's 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 so good it's incredible that's that's one of those things which I also feel like is such a cool that that's one idea um which we'll get into later but I don't mind talking about it now because this is where it happens and it pays off later on the idea of Craven getting Venom, I think, was stolen from me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because I I had an RP account, like, three years ago <laughs> for Spider-Man, right? <laughs> and I would just write Spider-Man stories. And one of my stories, because I thought this is such a good idea, no one's ever done it, is Ven- Craven is literally a hunter and Venom hunts Spider-Man. They're basically the same character. Why don't we just cut out the middleman? Fuck Eddie yeah. Brock. Let's make Venom Craven. And I made an yeah. edit. I've still got the edit. I've still got the post up. And it's Craven with his jacket no longer being the lion's head. It's the black suit symbol. And it's mm. fucking sick as hell. And then I, I was reading this. And I see Craven's got the gun in his mouth. And then the symbiote goes yeah, the on him. And stops him. And, and I was like, Zodarski. <laughs> 
we're on the he same really? wavelength. That would be so... F- I, I'm just going to call it Great Minds Think Alike, because he is a genius. But he is also quite active on Twitter. So, hmm, if you're listening <laughs> to this podcast... <laughs> that that was just something where I thought I was... We know. <laughs> we know. We don't worry. We won't call you out. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was a, a great moment at the end. But like the, the black suit and stuff in this. And something I want to talk about with the Secret Wars thing is... That was kind of a cool a cool thing where we dealt with, all right, all the heroes got is beamed away to Battle World and they're doing something. But in the comics, it's kind of like, all right, nothing happened and then they came back. He's like, no, everything would happen if they're all the heroes just vanished at once. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> so the fact that we have Russia, which was... Deciding to actually fucking, like, fire. Like, now, now's the time. When all the heroes yeah. are gone, now's the time, which I think was a very, a very smart... Again, very Watchmen esque thing of where uh, the moment Doctor Manhattan's gone is where Russia decides, oh, maybe we should attack now. Um, it felt the Vision scenes particularly felt a lot like, oh, we're just doing Watchmen here. Which again, Watchmen's mm-hmm. a seminal text. You find doing reference like this, I think, it enhances the whole material. But yeah. kind of disregarding the political thing, the thing that really hit me is like, oh shit, Peter missed his child's birth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of like, that was one of the things where, as this was coming out, I, I almost thought that might have been a bridge too far. I thought, about, oh, wow, you don't have to shit on his life that much. But it came from a really real place. Like, yeah, this is the worst possible timing. And that's just kind of what Spider-Man's whole deal is. And it's about, can he and MJ get through this? And at the end of this, it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, it ending with MJ leaving and Peter being alone with an Aunt May who they're they're not pulling any punches no. with that like Aunt May is becoming like senile like she is uh, developing issues like, you know, um, you know, like Alzheimer's type, like, you know, dementia, things like that, like, you know, just getting lost and like walking down the street and the police having to find her and bring her back like and that kind of shit. That's like the real like the real life heartbreaking shit um, that can be so naturally put into a Spider-Man story. Um, and so it's 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 gut wrenching. Uh, I mean, every issue finds a way to be kind of gut wrenching <laughs> yeah. in its own way, obviously, because it's Peter's life. Um, but that ending is is a gut punch because uh, this whole issue, um, you know, it doesn't start with Peter in a great place, but he's not in like a terrible place. It's just kind of there's a lot of shit he has to deal with right now. And then he comes back from war and everything is just horrible. Um, and yeah. It's uh, it's great stuff as a reader, not 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 so much if you're if you're Peter. Mm-hmm. It very much will... does feel like his his fear in the first two issues of not going to war is now this has come to back to bite him. Is now now as he actually does get drafted, you could say, and sent off to war as his wife's pregnant and having babies, and he comes back and the world's changed. Very much feels like a commentary about like people who come back to war and things are different. And the black suit's kind of like again is it's his it's his darkness. He's changed. He comes back and he's different. Um, it's that it's that kind of like post traumatic yes. stress that will bring back with them. It's that um, you know it's it's that thing that's expected of of soldiers when they go off and they come back and they don't they don't have the the support system that they need. So Peter comes back and he comes back to a world in which it's still fucking Peter's life. So the world's still out to ruin him. Um, So he comes back and he has no healthy way to deal with that. And he has no healthy way to deal with what's going on with the black suit. And it's all really great. Mm -hmm. But given all of that, then as we move away from symbiotes, this one was the one I think every Spider-Man fan was issue four was the one nineties was the one. Everyone was really like, all right, this is the most infamously bad period of Spider-Man comics. Everyone hates the 90s clone saga. Scarlet Spider's cool, Kane's mm-hmm. cool, but no one actually likes the stories they came from. This is probably the first attempt to rewrite that. And I'm so happy they fucking did. I've got a good clone saga now. <laughs> this, is, this one was fantastic. And this one I also thought was a really, really clever way to deal with kind of the bad 
choices that were being made at that time in comics and make it a narrative decision. Up to this point, we've been dealing with good comics. Good comic decisions, and we're changing them to see how we can fit uh, this version of PR. This is the first time we've really gotten to, alright, this has been a shit bit where Spider-Man's been written out of character. Where Spider-Man's di- distancing Mary Jane, and he's kind of an asshole, and he's he, he's doing things that he really shouldn't be. So we open this with medium fucking billionaire Peter Parker, who's fucking Jessica Jones. Is that, yep! <laughs> <laughs> he's obviously not in his right state. Everything he, he's he's been changed by MJ leaving with the kids and everything. He's he's kind of just in a very depressed state of mind. He's got he's rich. He's he's become successful, but it's mm-hmm. not fulfilled him in the slightest. It's it's made things yeah. worse even. So all of that I thought was really interesting. Uh, and then for trivia, bringing in Ben, um, bringing in Ben again, I thought was really cool because. There are two clone sagas in the comics. There's one that happens in the 70s, which was the original. And the story of that is Miles Warren clones Spider-Man, has the two Spider-Men fight, and then one of the Spider-Men dies in a smokestack. And then the Spider-Man who survives is like, okay, we, that's the real Pia. Or is it? Dot, dot, dot. Then ah. in the 90s, they were like, oh, we Spider-Man continuity's got too big. We don't want to bring in Spider-Man anymore. People can't get into it. We need to reboot the character. We don't want him to be married to Mary Jane anymore. So they bring in the clone again. They revive him. And they were going, the original plan was Ben Riley was going to become the new main Spider-Man. And Peter Parker was going to run off into the sunset with Mary Jane. And that never happened because they got cold feet. And I'm like, oh, well, no. Peter Parker needs to be Spider-Man. So they just killed Ben. Sure. This does that. <laughs> this does the mm-hmm. original ending. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Um, they do the whole... Because they, they, they make Doc Ock a villain again <laughs> after he retired and got with with uh, with May, which, again, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that was a thing. And I then she that was dumps just his ass. Book, apparently that was a thing. <laughs> and then he comes back. He's angry. He's upset. And you can kind of see him. You can kind of see the, the, the idea for what will become Superior Spider-Man kind yes. of starting to form here, right? Of Doc Ock kind of entering another body and you can kind of see him using the clone and stuff like that as a, as kind of a route to that happening. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and then they do the whole reveal of, Oh, you're the clone. And he's, and of course me who only knows that the clone saga is a thing and that Ben Riley is a thing and doesn't really know anything about it. I'm just like, Oh my, Oh my God, wait, Peter's the clone. What? Um, and then they get to the end of it and you've got that whole great bit with Norman Osborn. Um, so, I mean, again, I, this was another example of me not being familiar with this material, really enjoying this, and probably just going to be like, all right, so this is what happened. I'm not going to go back and read the actual clone saga. I'm just yeah. going to assume it went down <laughs> kind of like this. Just, you know, obviously, de-age obviously everyone. Are, yeah, de age everyone. Aunt May's still alive, but for the most part, this is what happened. Well, actually, Aunt gonna... May did die in the clone saga. Fuck. Oh my god! But I'm gonna the, turn in my comic book fan card. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go worry. cancel my poll. I'm gonna go cancel my poll list. You never um, have to worry about shit that happened in the clone saga. Everyone just ignored <laughs> that. She she was fine. She got better. <laughs> oh good. Um, <laughs> but no, I I really love that when he we goes to confront Norman about it, and Norman's just like, I don't know what you're talking about, and then he tells him, and he gets that like fucking creepy ass face. Yeah. Like, he's oh, it's so good. Um, and this was one of those things where I'm like, I don't know, I don't know this material, but I'm enjoying kind of every second of this. Um, and then Norman dies of a heart attack after hearing that his son is dead. And his last words are just how much he hates Spider-Man. I mean, it's, it's all fucking great. And maybe, maybe that shit's in the comics. I don't know, but I loved no, it in here. It's, um, it's one of those things where yes, in the comics, Norman was revealed as the big bad of the clone saga at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, this is what I think is so smart about this. Because originally, that was just, we have no idea how to end this story. It's become so convoluted. The Green Goblin's been dead since the 70s because he died in the Gwen Stacy issue. Let's just bring him back and say he was behind everything. Just to wrap it all up and just to end it. So they did that. And that's how Norman Osborn's kicking around today. Beforehand, Norman was kind of considered mm-hmm. almost like a Jason Todd, gotcha. as where well, cool. his death was. And so... I mean, like I said, mm-hmm. very much enjoyed this one, uh, and I'm glad that my first experience with the Clone Saga was something that's actually done well. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those things where 
we've got that going on. And then we've got um, Norman's death in this, I think, is one of my favourite... This is what how I want the Green Goblin to die in everything now. Where he is just hate. He he literally has a heart attack because he's so angry and he just hates Peter mm-hmm. Parker so much. And that he can't get over it. All he is is hate. He he's the he's the side of Peter that never learned a single ounce of responsibility in his entire life. Peter, there's that great bit in Spectacular where his catchphrase is "I never apologize," which is what that's Norman Osborn yeah. to a T. And they keep that in this where even after all these years, even after his son is dead and Peter's the only one who comes to talk to him and give him some fucking kind of contact, he can't, he's just, he, he tries to strangle him as he dies. Like It's just pure, vile, I hate this man more than any man can ever hate. And it's so good. <laughs> it's probably one of the only, like, Joker loves Batman. The Joker doesn't hate Batman. Lex right. Luthor hates Superman, but it's almost kind of like a respect thing, where like they they kind of they can team up sometimes and everything. Green Goblin and Peter, I, it's hard to think of anything in fiction where two fuckers just despise each other. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and again, it, it's 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 cool to see how naturally this all plays as one big story for someone who doesn't know the source material for these times in Peter's life. Um, and it all plays so naturally to me. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. And again, I, and, and you're right, they do end with um, Peter seeing just all of this. And, and I think seeing Norman who could have just had a normal life, he kind of, it changes him and he, he goes and he, he decides he's just going to go find Mary Jane and he's going to make up for everything. And he's going, that's going to be his life now. Uh, and it's a really touching moment. Um, so yeah, and uh, it can, again, continues. I, I, I've got nothing but praise for this so far. Mm-hmm. That's one of those things where, um, it's, it, it, it's a great way to, heal the wounds a bit this is this is the start of when we're, we're starting to make peter's life come back is after the 90s mm-hmm. and it, again it, it feels like that almost like publication history wise is after the 90s spider-man comics we got into the 2000s that's when things started to get good again it, it, it feels like we're almost peter parker the character is commentating on how marvel treated him <laughs> where like <laughs> now he's actually all right he's with mj and we're, we're not going to try and retcon anything we're just going to play it out now um so when we move into Civil War, this is probably the one that's the most different in terms of concept because we don't we do the the big thing from Civil War in the comics is Spider-Man takes off his mask and reveals himself to the world because um, he's he's working with Iron Man and that was like the big status quo change um, and we do that in this we do have at the end Peter Parker's identity revealed to the world. But it's in a very different manner, and his interactions with Tony in this are so... I'm going to be honest, (laughs) I like MCU Spider-Man, I really do, I'm one of his defenders. But there is this kind of guilty part of me that really loves Peter Parker walking up to Tony Stark and telling him to eat shit. Yeah. (laughs) Like, there's just a really kind of, like, eat the rich Spider-Man kind of dig in here that I really like. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, you know, this this book in general, um, but this issue, uh, of course, is really what started to sell me on the idea of Spider-Man being more of a legacy hero. Um, because obviously I was always fine with Miles. Um, you know, Miles is great. I love him. But seeing uh, Claire, seeing his kids in this, yeah. um, I was immediately just like, well, man. I want to see one of them take up the mantle. Like, I want to see that. Like, I want to see Peter get old and have kids who take over as Spider-Man or whatever. Um, and to uh, and you get to open with Ben Riley, who essentially kind of dies uh, in Spider-Man's place as this. Is this who is this again? Morbius? Morlan. Is Mor- Morlan. Morlan. Uh, Morlan. Morlan. Okay. Morlan. Someone I did when I'm going to this. I was like, ah, oh, he's not going to know who the fuck this is. Yeah. I was just like, I was like, is this like, yeah. Cause I remember they, they called him Morlan like once or twice, but at first I thought he was Morbius and I was just like, the fuck is happening? Um, 
but then uh but then but you get the you get the double punch of uh ben riley dies and then immediately in the next page they talk about like oh yeah no spider-man was there during uh 9-11 yeah. and he 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 put his mask on and he he did everything he could to help even after he said he had retired and that was something i was not expecting i was just like oh shit um I, mm, okay um so that was something i had to uh kind of react to and then um yeah getting into the civil war um aspect of it and this is where i got a little bit confused because i I wasn't sure if the Tony Stark from Vietnam was like the same Tony Stark because he somehow looks younger than yeah, Peter does. Right? And I was just like, wait, so was the Tony Stark from the 70s like his dad or does he just look that good? I think he just looks that good. He that just was, looks that good. That was one of the things that I, I do agree with is the cap in particular. Cap, I'm like, you are still kicking. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, Cap, I was just like, wait, you're still alive? <laughs> That's what I was I, like. Maybe, maybe he's a super soldier. Maybe he ages more slowly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, like, I, <laughs> I was just like, I thought you'd be on, like, some ang shit where, like, being in the ice cut your lifespan or, or something. But, like, no, Cap's still around and he's still fighting. And, like, the. I, like, that's something I was, as well. As Tony says, all the, all the young heroes. We're on the registration, and Cap's kind of like the old guard. I was like, mm, I don't know. I would have liked. I, I would have think it would have been cooler if like all the old heroes are like status quo maintainers now, and Cap's yeah. leading the next generation of kids mm -hmm. who are like fuck yeah. fuck that noise. So that's that's a decision I I don't particularly agree with. I feel like the the civil war kind of devolving to just two old people uh, fighting. I thought was like a little bit, oh, that's, that's a bit anticlimactic compared to what this has been building towards. And now we've got Peter's kids. Like, well, this could be a good chance to introduce, like, wh whoever heroes had kids during this time. Like, wh whatever weird... Because this, again, out of consumers, you can do whatever you want. You can do weird pairings and stuff. Like, you can throw in anyone. Um, so that that was something I was like, all right, the Civil War portion of this could have been a bit better. Um, I really like the moment where Peter gets his suit on and he starts fighting again. Uh, and the tragedy of that is he's he's busy dealing with this shit, uh, and Morlan Morlan takes out his son, um, and I, I thought that was again this was fuck <laughs> more just more pain mm -hmm. and tragedy, but it's in a very heroic fashion, and that's something where um, this period of Spider-Man the two thousands was where we had uh, Morlan was kind of like the thing that people really pushed because he came in. Uh, as like when Spider-Man just got his big new run with J. Michael Skrzynski, uh and Morlan was just like this force of nature. He just battered through everything. He's the main villain of the Spider-Verse comic. There's rumors that he'll be the Spider-Verse 2 villain or something. So he's kind of like niche, but is coming big. So I wasn't surprised to see him in here, but he's definitely not done as well as Venom, Ock, and Goblin. And I think that's just because he's not as good as... He isn't, you, you can't touch those three when it comes to Spider-Man villains. Is there? 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 There is big boys. So this issue, I feel like, wasn't was wasn't as strong as the ones that came before it. But I also feel like it's it's one that was necessary to lead into like a very beautiful final chapter. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I you're absolutely right. I had no idea what was going on with this guy. But I mean, I liked him fine. I mean, I, I, I like that he's kind of this. I have a thing for like, I like force of nature villains, villains who are just so single minded. They just have a purpose and that is what they're there to do. And so I really like that. Like Morlin, he's got, you know, where he's just he talks about himself like he's just this inevitable force of nature. And I'm always I'm always here for that. So and again, seeing Claire uh, and Ben fighting him and kind of figuring out how to outsmart him and take him down. Um, it made me really enjoy those two characters. And like I said, really sold me on the idea of uh, Spider-Man being more of a, of a legacy mantle. Um, but no, it was great to see Pete go up against uh, Tony Stark and just be like, fuck you, you fucking <laughs> asshole. Um, Cause I'm not the biggest fan of, of MCU Peter um, in general. But I mean, again, that could just be because I mostly grew up with like, just different Spider-Man influences. Cause you know, like I said, I have, I have very little history with proper earth six, one, six Spider-Man or whatever. Oh, now you using um, proper terminology. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but no good stuff. Um, 
it's it's very weird to see him talking to Cap and saying we're both old men. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> just a trip. <laughs> yeah, you're just like okay, and yeah, I like Cap. I'm just like yeah, you're you're looking good, Cap. I and mean, we don't see you without the mask on, but I mean you, you and Hawkeye's over there looking like old as fuck. Um, and it, yeah, it's weird because you like Tony has has starked out all of the other all of the Avengers on his side. I don't know if that happened in the comics again because I don't I didn't read Civil War, but. Still found this very compelling. Still enjoyed this. Moreland was fine. Um, also, I like how Peter gets like a different suit in every issue. That's actually something I don't like. I'm, I'm, not, right. I'm not that big a fan of these alternative suits. I think some I like, of them are kind of ugly. <laughs> I like the 70s one with like the bits of silver on it. I think that one's okay. That one's not bad. I don't like the Secret Wars one, but it doesn't last very long. He just immediately gets the black suit, so whatever. Um, what's the other one? The one that has like the weird like padding or like the ribbing around one. it. Yeah. Well, no, there's the one. There's the one from the uh, where they do the the Ben Riley is the real Peter oh, reveal yes, yes, where he's yes, got yes. he's got that suit that's got like the ribbing on it. That one's okay. Um, yeah, and then this one I think is just weird. This one I think is just kind of bizarre. Um, it, the like black, where, uh... it's, it looks all loose on him. Like it's not like tight fitting anymore. And it's I don't know. It's a weird suit. Mm-hmm. It, it's something where I feel like overall this would have been a stronger. I, I feel like it hurts the timelessness of it a little bit. If this had just been the red and blue suit, and in one issue he's got the black suit, but every issue he's kind of his build. Like instead of changing the suit design, like maybe you could have done. Instead of massive revamps, do like issue one, he's got the squinty eyes. And then and then his eyes, like his, the, the web design gets changed. And like it, the, the, like mm. Now he looks like Todd McFarlane Spider-Man. Now he looks like yeah. Mark ba- ba- Bagley classic Spider-Man. I think that would have been a cool and more subtle take to pay tribute to the artists of the time while still keeping it. Because it, it is kind of distracting sometimes. Like I'm, I'm really into the, the story, but then it's just like a Spider-Man suit I don't like. And I'm just like, oh, this would be so much more... This would be a wallpaper panel if uh, he, was using the, he was in the proper suit. Or even if not, pull some alternative suits from the comics. Like, if one issue he's got, like, the fucking... Uh, the, the, the silver, like, bulletproof Spider-Man costume, that would have been cool. Like, something like that. I don't know. Just as a... Uh, as an artiste, uh, pretentious asshole, that was that was something where I was like, ah, oh, I wouldn't have made that choice. I would just I would just kept him in the red and blue, uh, for the majority of this. Yeah, I think I I think I probably overall agree with you. At the same time, it really doesn't bother me that much until this most recent issue because I think most of the suits are fine and at the very least not bad enough to be distracting. Um, until we get to this one, which I really didn't like this suit all that much. Um, but at the same time, like I hear what you're saying and I think that probably would have been the better way to go. But I mean, Spider-Man does seem to kind of have a history of having a bunch of different suits. That's so, true. I mean, it, it is a, it is a, 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 a part of the character that it does make sense to pay tribute to on, on some level, um, for sure. Yeah, I feel, yeah. And the one that bugs me about this one is... We do, we do Miles in this in this final issue, but we don't yeah. get Miles in his cool fucking suit. Miles's suit doesn't make a single appearance in this book, and that sucks. Yeah, is he? I mean, I guess he's wearing. I guess he's kind of wearing it under the like weird. It's like jacket. a variant, though. It's still not his yeah. proper suit, and I'm like, ah, oh, but Miles's suit is fucking bull. <laughs> we don't get to see it much, but I think Claire's suit. In this is pretty baller. In, yeah. Like the first couple issues, uh, I like and I was that. also su- I was also surprised because like Ben, I guess survived his his fight with Morlin. He's just like like he has to walk with a cane and stuff. He's just drained. So, yeah, he's just he's. Uh. But this was the issue that I was like, okay, I'm reading it, I'm going forward, and then I and then I found myself three pages in. I was like, wait. I feel like I missed something. What the fuck are we doing? And then I had to go back and I'm like, okay, the war. En- oh, like the war ended and, and doom took over the world. Okay. So I had to like, I, I was like, I totally fucking missed that. I had to go back and like, I had to go back to the, the beginning of the issue and start reading it again. I was just like, oh, okay. I just, I just missed that line. Um, Cause I was very confused. As to- this was the only one where I'm just like, I do not immediately kind of understand what is happening right now. 
Because um, this is the only one that... You've got the Superior Spider-Man stuff, yeah. but the conflict in this is entirely original. This is the, Exactly, This yeah. is the first time where it's not. This is the Clone Saga one. This is the Kraven's Lost Hunt one. This is, this is just Zadarsky doing the end of Spider-Man. So he put him on the yep. biggest stage possible where... Um, Doctor Doom has taken advantage of the Civil War and now rules the Earth. And Spider-Man's, which is a cool idea. That's just I'm always for Doctor yeah. Doom. It's funny that he never makes an appearance in this entire book. It's only his name. We never actually get to see him, which I think is funny uh, for like the final big villain. But again, it's just I, I like the idea that Spider-Man, Spider-Man isn't the one who's changing the world in these. Peter's always the receiving end of the changes. And even in his final issue, Spider-Man isn't the guy who leads the Avengers. Spider-Man isn't the big A-time hero. That's just not who he is. He's the guy who will inspire others through his example. I, I, I spoke on Twitter about this for a little bit. But Spider-Man, to me, is the Vincent Van Gogh of superheroes, where he will be appreciated after his time. Like, in his time, people think Spider-Man's, like, in verse, obviously we know Spider-Man's great, but in verse, people think Spider-Man's a menace, think he's creepy, and even other heroes think he's just kind of a loser. Um, and I like that this keeps that. Like, no, no, no one's got a really high opinion of Spider-Man. But down the line, in the future of the Marvel Universe, it's my opinion and my kind of headcanon that it's not Captain America or Iron Man or Thor who they talk about, it's Spider-Man. And his legacy mm-hmm. is the one that informs the future of the next generation. So they, they've got lines in this where they talk about the Camilla Khan and Miles Morales and like the next generation of Marvel heroes all taking their lessons from Peter above all. And I'm like, yes, that's, mm-hmm. that's how yeah. he changes the world. Is It's not through big acts of just a badass hero. It's just from, through being there to teach kids a lesson because he's got this full face mask. He was a kid when he was that age. He's the one who gets it. So seeing him up with Miles and his own children, yeah, it makes absolute sense that Spider-Man should be a legacy character. You're absolutely right, because all he is is about, in terms of as he gets older at least, is he's learned the best lessons, where he's probably the best mental figure Marvel could give you. Like, out of yeah. everyone in Marvel, let me train with Spider-Man, because that Spider-Man will talk to you like an actual person, and he's been there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I loved all this. Um, I loved the surprise reveal that they did Superior Spider-Man, but Doc Ock was actually in Miles' yeah, body. Uh, that so was fucked fucking, up. That was so cool. Um, loved that bit. Um, I loved the the fight with essentially the Sinister Six inside Octavius's head with the different like versions of Spider-Man that we saw throughout the book. I mean, it it just it manages to take a concept of we're going to tell these seemingly disparate stories in Spider-Man's publication history as if they were one big story. And it actually does make them one big story. Um, You know, Otto and Norman both kind of coming back time and time again to haunt Peter, this making the case for Otto being truly one of, if not Peter's most defining foe. Um, so, I mean, they, they managed to tell all these seemingly entirely unrelated stories into something that is completely compelling as a full story that still, um, you know, manages to to feel coherent and feel like uh, a story worth telling as opposed to just a highlight reel. Um, and so bringing Otto back in the final moments of this was, I think, the perfect way to really tie everything up. Um, the send off is incredible. The conversation he has with Mary Jane. I mean, it's all fantastic stuff. And I love that line. Um, he's got, I can't let you sacrifice a life that's not your own when he sends, uh, Otto and miles back. I mean, just, there's so much good here. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something which I think is really strong is when Mm -hmm. you've, you've seen the Peter who's been kind of life's not fair. I this I don't deserve this, and you're right. He doesn't deserve any of this. But we see him mature and kind of backslide a couple of times. But this is where he's at his most. I figured it out. I know what my purpose is. This is Spider-Man at the end of his life, and he's he, he's got all his lessons, all his pain, all his hardship has formed him into this this guy who we'll never see in ongoing stories. But he is very much almost. This is the peak. 
not of physical power, but of just like mental health. <laughs> this mm-hmm, this yeah. this is a Spider Man who can figure out what Otto's deal is in this LA. This is a Spider Man who's willing to make this life and death decision, but will also not put someone else in that position and it will say as them. Uh, will hold on to his le- very last moment, and all of this was so good. One of my favorite things in this issue is we do the, 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 because the symbiote in this, Eddie Brock's not in here, and I was like, oh, okay, so we're just going Craven's Venom. But we don't forget that Venom's not one person, Venom's two. The symbiote is a character, and we mm-hmm. still do the symbiote loves Peter in this, where we have the symbiote sacrifice himself, or itself, I should say, the sacri- uh, sacrifice itself. To protect Peter one final time, like we the 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 giant white spider logo holding the ship from falling yeah. apart as he closes. That's such a good visual. That's mm-hmm. so. And then once it blows up, uh, you, you see Peter with Mary Jane, and it's he's finally got he, just like peace in his life at, at last. He's 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 had his biggest responsibility, but it's not his job anymore now. And the the sentiment at the end, I think, is why. Spider-Man has to be a legacy character because this yeah. this was something I'd never thought about, but it, it it brings it full circle. Is through being a legacy character, Peter actually does get to right the wrong he never thought he'd be able to do. Is Miles stops the mugger? <laughs> it's not mm-hmm. the same mugger, but it's the same thing where it's like, I will make sure no one will ever make the mistake I made when I first started out. And Miles mm-hmm. doesn't because Peter taught him those lessons. So and Miles, it's cool as much as I was like, oh, Miles should have his own suit. It's a really cool visual to have Miles in the classic suit where you think it's a flashback, but it's not. It's 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 current now. Ah, oh, it's so good. <laughs> what an ending. Yeah. What an ending it, uh... for a Spider-Man story to fix oh, the yeah. big, the first mistake, the 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 primal sin, if you will. Yeah. Good stuff. Also, how cool is it that the I, I don't know if we did we touch on this that the Venom symbiote is just wearing the bones of Craven. Yeah, he's like Craven. That shit's cool. That's because I mean that that reminds me of like the Venom symbiote using Peter's unconscious body in Spectacular Spider-Man, like shit like that that they do with the symbiote. I always think is cool. Um, so that was just neat. That's that's much less impactful and meaningful than whatever you just said but i just think it's cool <laughs> no <laughs> it's I, I think i think it's really cool it, that, that's another i wouldn't be surprised because this is so deep in lore but that was from um in a what if what if the secret wars never ended is they never came back to earth they just were trapped yeah, on this world forever so peter was just stuck in the black suit and eventually they go over to him and he's like, well, Pete, you haven't taken your mask off in like 20 years. And it's just bones because the symbiote yeah. just drained him completely. And I, I oh, that's, that's so cool. good. So th- the fact that they keep that in this, uh, but apply it to Craven, I think is a yep. really, really cool idea. No, yeah, I, I love that aspect of the symbiote. I love that we do superior in this, but we don't do superior. Like we, we, we completely rewrite that. I like how I like uh, Aunt May's final lesson to uh, oh, it almost mirrors what we get with Mary Jane and Peter ne- uh, next. So it it's done a very good job at showing why if you're gonna make a case that Otto uh, is Spider Man's biggest me- villain is because you show just how similar they are. Is they both mm-hmm. they're both just in pain and they both just need love and that that they feel guilt overwhelmed with guilt for things they didn't do and their intelligence is so good that they feel it's being wasted. Um, but Aunt May basically just tells him that he needs to stop lashing out of his, for his own mistakes, which is something Peter learned. Uh, I think you could say in like the the fourth issue is that's when Peter stops lashing out at other people. Um, mm-hmm. Which again, he's like fifty at that point, so it's pretty fucking late in the game. Where again, yeah. it's 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 treating these characters as real flawed people. It's like Peter in this doesn't get over his problems quickly and it, it costs him a lot of time in family relationships that will never get back and at the end he, he doesn't get to see his kids grow up like fully he doesn't get to have his last moments with mary jane properly he does die on his own on a spaceship but he's found peace with himself where he doesn't blame that he just he just does his job so all of that i think was just beautifully beautifully done um a fantastic send-off as well because it's something where we never see Uncle Ben in this. We never do no. the origin. 
but we still tie it back to that. Like the first, it's crazy in a Spider-Man story, right? That the first c- c- image of what we associate with Spider-Man's origin is the very last page, <laughs> but it's still a flash forward. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Um, that final, that final panel, that final ending, uh, really hits you. Um, I love this, uh, even as someone who is on the whole pretty like someone who is familiar with Spider-Man as a character and, and you know, obviously seeing all the films, seeing pretty much everything that's animated and reading all of Ultimate. I feel safe in saying that I, I generally feel that I get Spider-Man, but I just don't have the comic book history. And yet I never I never once bounced off this. I never once wasn't compelled by this. Um, And I mean, part of that is, of course, just Zdarsky's strength as a writer. Um, The guy just knows how to make something infinitely entertaining while also uh, really saying something about this character. Um, But I mean, this is fantastic. I think this is I love that Marvel let this happen. Um, I would love to actually (laughs) potentially see more of this, more of these, because I mean, this is the kind of stuff that helps you get into Spider-Man continuity proper, right? Like, and, and same thing with like Batman, like you can jump into a lot of these, uh, big Batman stories, uh, get a feel for what Batman is like, maybe get a feel for a couple of the villains and then maybe use that as a jumping point to kind of jump into the, the, the stories proper. And I feel like this is kind of the same thing. Like I, I feel a little bit more confident in my ability to maybe jump back and read some of the issues and, and kind of understand what's happening. Oh, um, for sure. Like like this particularly because this this doesn't make up continuity. It just does does beat to beat to beat to beat to beat all the all the greatest hits, if you will. I feel fully mm-hmm. confident that if you throw into any era of Spider Man, you may not like it, but you'll know what's going on, <laughs> which is yeah. incredible to say for a six issue comic book. <laughs> it's like a that's a task that the entire industry has been trying to scramble to get. Of like, how do we get people to understand this? Is like just like here you go. Here's the Spider-Man done, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is cool, because, I mean, Spider-Man arguably is one of the ones that's up there with, like, you got, like, what? Like, Spider-Man, uh, Batman, uh, probably the X-Men, when you're thinking of just, like, comic book um, baggage that's that's almost impenetrable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think this was really cool. Yeah, I, w- I would... I would kill for an x-men one of these actually i think that one would be just as it'd be even crazier just because but like the the rosters and everything or like every issue is a different team and like because they, they they age out yeah. now and like that'd be so cool man just to see yeah just to see cool. all the x-men's change i don't know how you do gene and scott and and logo where they're like all 60 it'd be a bit yeesh <laughs> but I, <laughs> I guess they could still yeah. get it on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was this was fantastic. Before we um, move on to ratings, though, because you did say you want to see more, I will share this with you. The original pitch for this is each one of these issues was going to be their own miniseries. You know, I I was kind of thinking that too as I was reading this. I was like, I feel like I could live in the world of this issue for a while and and be interested in what's going on. But at the same time, I think the challenge of making it in only six issues, while it does mean some things just kind of come at you really fast. Like I think especially in the first issue, you're just kind of going from like, Oh, okay. So Peter, he doesn't know what he's going to do about the draft and about Vietnam. And then like, Whoa, okay. Now Norman knows he's mm-hmm. Spider-Man and Oh, okay. Okay. We're, we're moving, we're moving. So like, I feel like it, it, the pacing does kind of throw you off for a minute, but um, I think the challenge of uh, making this in six issues means Zdarsky doesn't have the, ability to waste any uh any any uh page time he doesn't he doesn't waste a thing um and yeah some things you just kind of have to take on the chin and and go with it like you just be like okay it's been like 10 years or whatever i guess Otto's retired and is dating may whatever okay fine like yeah some of that kind of suffers and like you could have actually maybe seen that play out but at the same time like i said i think the challenge of of making this a six issue mini means that he really has to kind of hone in on what is the main thing you are trying to um to tell us and and truth be told even though i wouldn't mind living in the world of any of these issues i don't feel like i was ever shortchanged uh on a deep or compelling story um 
I don't feel like making this in six issues hurt it. Uh, whereas making it, you know, many, many, many would have made it better necessarily. I think it would have just been a, a different experience. And to be honest, I'm almost kind of glad it was this way because I think if you had done this where it was six mini series, then you would have just had the same problem of this huge barrier to entry. Um, whereas I think just making it a six issue mini, uh, makes it more accessible, which is kind of the point of it. And meant that, you know, he really had to figure out what was important to him that he wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think that's a very good point. And I think that's you saying that particularly as t the target audience for this, I feel. I mean, this, this is kind of for everyone. It's for, like, again, long-time fans and for new fans and kind of people in the middle. But I think it's more so for that middle crew who knows Spider-Man but doesn't know no Spider-Man. Um, yeah. You saying that, no, it was the right choice to do these six issues, I think is... Uh, if Chip Zazarski ever does listen to this, uh, he'll be very annoyed if I keep mispronouncing his name. <laughs> but uh -huh. I think he might have a bit of a sigh of relief about that one. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It, it, it was the right choice. Because, again, yeah. that's something I didn't even think about. But, yeah, you're right. Uh, fuck, this has been like six times six. I can't do quick yeah. math. Yeah. But like that's a lot. That's a that's a whole exactly. run of comics. No, yeah, you're right. Um, I, mean, I think you just would have had the same problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might as well just it'd be just all all over again. Where it's just like, well, now got go back through this backlog. So yeah, you're right. Well, with just this one piece, then uh, I'll guess we'll go on to ratings. As we've gushed about this quite a lot, I think you can imagine it's going to be quite high. Uh, I would oh, yeah. be cheeky and just ditch off a point or a half a point for the, the costumes just because I'm, <laughs> I just want to... There was damn costumes, but they don't matter. This, this, this book's no. just fantastic. This is brilliant. This is one of the few times when you're reading comics as they come out, do you get to experience something that will be something that will be seminal. This is going to inform Spider-Man comics for the rest of time in the same way Dark Knight Returns does Batman or Star does Superman. You can argue if this is as good as those or if it's as crafted as those, if there are some issues to follow, but it's definitely in that same tier um, of just you give this to a Spider-Man fan because this is now required, required viewing, required reading, required watching. Uh, Spider-Man Life Story, absolutely fantastic work. And we're going to give it mm -hmm. five out of five stole my ideas at Craven Venom. <laughs> nice. Um, I agree. I'm right there with you. Um, I think this is really great stuff. I, I wasn't really sure what to expect going in to it. Just hearing the pitch, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, well, I mean, that sounds interesting. Um, but then jumping into it and, and really loving it and feeling like I really read uh, something that had something to say on the character um, and something that I would definitely recommend like, oh, you like Spider-Man? You want to like know more about what he's what Peter Parker really is like when he's written well and you want to get a better sense of his history. Um, check this out. It's six issues. You got time and you're going to go on a wild ride. So I love this. I'm going to give it five out of five. Um, fucking baller ass black goblin designs. Yeah, I can't no, I can't looking. stop looking at it. It's so good. Like it's. I've looked at this for five hours now. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that, it's so please, good. I love it. If we ever do Harry Goblin and PS4 game or the MCU or something, right? has to be this. Just base it off this. It would be so cool to see this in live action. I mean, they're never going to do actual Green Goblin anyway, so maybe it's just a hopeless cause, but this would be cool. And before we close off, one other thing as well. Hey, uh, can we get this as like an animated film or something? Or oh my like, god. Can you fuck, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, if if Marvel would step up their like animation game and they did an adaptation of this, oh my god, that'd be. And they didn't change anything; they just a straight adaptation of it. And you that'd got go like toe to, that'd go that'd go toe to toe with some of the best DC animated stuff. You got like every single decade or something, right? You get a different Spider-Man voice actor, and you go in terms of age. So like, oh shit, get like Josh Keaton, in Josh Keaton one, and then you go Christopher Daniel Barnes, and then you yeah. go eventually. And in the last issue, he sounds like sixty Spider. -Man. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Mario Spider sounds like oh, that would be so. There's so much you could do with this premise uh, in animation, yep. and it's it's short. It's it's not. I mean, it's packed, but you could fit this into a runtime quite easily. It's got such a pace to it. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All I right. Love it. 
And that's all all she wrote on Spider Man Life Story. Matt we need a discussion Yo. topic for next week. Um I feel like I don't know. This is a fun show. We talk about a lot of stuff. I want to talk about something maybe slightly more serious, uh, just because this has been on my mind a lot. Um, I kind of want to revisit me. And, and you can tell me if you guys have talked about this before and I can I can try to think of something else. But I kind of want to talk about like. Separation of of art from the artist. Um, this has been on my mind a lot because of uh, J.K. Rowling, because of uh, Chris Avalon, who's extremely uh influential to me uh for his work uh with obsidian um and all of the things that are coming out about these people obviously jk and just her her beliefs and everything that's coming out about chris avalon and everything that's coming out about ubisoft and everything that's coming out about fucking um god knows how many different people uh in in different industries um and it's it's interesting because you know, separating art from the artist was easier in a time before social media and a time before the internet. Um, and I kind of want to chat about chat a bit about where that's changed and if it's possible to even draw a line anymore, if it's possible to do that, or if it's morally right to even try to do that. Um, cause that's just been on my mind a lot. So if it's not something you guys have really tackled, uh, recently, it's something that I would maybe like to talk about and, flail about and try to say something coherent on <laughs> no i i think i think we can that's a perfect topic i've just been doing a quick little check through the backlog and we're doing a couple of episodes on art but not this but i think this has come up a couple of times during other episodes but not an episode dedicated to this topic so no i think this is perfect grounds great topic all right then we will be back with a heavier uh girthier mm. thick episode mm. of Geeky Chat over next week all over your face, neck and chest. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Holy shit. But until then, you'll have to warm up your ear pussies. <laughs> <But when> we... <laughs> I'm getting at all my bad jokes before we go into heavy topics next time. All right, let me have this one. Uh, because me and Matt will be signing off. I am the champion of the oppressed. I am the Santa Erotica lover. And we have been you're geeky gentlemen. And we will be discussing things. Doom, 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 doom. I gotta find a new sign off. <laughs>